again, everyone, for joining us today. My name is Morgan Goldsmith. I am a registered nurse and the Director of Clinical Marketing and Education with Hospi Corporation and Macy Catheter team. Today, I am honored to introduce Patty Moore, who will be presenting and introducing her very exciting program, Creating a Culture of Care. This webinar is part of our Thought Leader series, so thank you all for joining us today. I know many of you had indicated during the registration that you were doing Lunch and Learn, so uh, depending on where you're at across the country, welcome and, and thank you again. A little background on Patty. Uh, Patty began her career in the nursing profession, where her commitment to service and compassionate leadership first took root, eventually becoming the executive director of Hospice of North Central, excuse me, Florida, now Haven Hospice. Patty led that organization to a position of national prominence and through significant growth. In 1999, Patty founded the Watershed Group, a nationwide strategic consulting, speaking, and coaching company based on hospice concepts of care. She helped the organizations manage change into positive growth and financial stability. Patty's insights help clients create sustained high performance cultures in order to realize their full potential, even in periods of significant change and transition. She's a rec nationally recognized subject matter expert and thought leader in hospice and end of life care, inspired leadership and team development, mission and vision alignment, and creating cultures of care and competence. Thank you so much for joining us today, Patty. Uh, it's an honor to have you here. I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am delighted to be here and to share with you my webinar, Creating a Culture of Care. So we have some objectives. The, these are the three objectives for this, this session. Um, at the end, my expectation would be that you could describe three factors that make up a positive culture list the four key factors of powerful teams and great cultures, and identify at least four belonging cues for successful teams and cultures. So I'm, I'm delighted, as I said, to be here, and I wanna talk about culture. You know, some of you might be um, put off by this, this slide, but when I first encountered culture, I was in uh, a freshman in college and working in the microbiology lab and I loved that job. It was, um, I had never had any experience with um, science before, although I knew I wanted to be a nurse. But my job was to put out the slides and the test tubes and the petri dishes and the Bunsen burners and the inoculating loop. Some of you are, I, I'm sure, nodding your heads thinking, oh yes, I remember that back in microbiology. And then I also had to make the auger where the, the bacteria or, would grow, and that was what we called creating a culture. And so I had to also make sure the incubator was um, at the proper temperature, and that's where the bacteria slept at night. And if it wasn't exactly perfect, the, the staph, Staphylococcus aureus and the the e and the Pseudonomus aeruginosa would die. So I had to make sure that I had created the culture and it was a, a, a culture that would allow these microbes to grow. So that's my first example of how I was introduced into culture. And then when you think about what the dictionary calls culture in, in, in terms of science, it's the Cultivation of bacteria, tissues, cells, or otherwise in an artificial medium containing nutrients. And then you've got pop culture. And that includes the customs and the arts, the social institutions, and the achievements of a particular nation or people or social group. And then the, you know, there's culture shock. I was over in Europe this summer, fortunately, and I had a fabulous vacation, but it was each, each culture, each country has its own um, characteristics. And so culture is made up of a lot of things and it's not just one thing. It, it, it's, it's the combination of language and beliefs, the cultural um, community priorities, the values, and those are the things that make up culture. So 
this is what I know to believe. And values drive behavior. Be behaviors drive the culture. And culture drives performance. And culture trumps strategy every single time. You know, it's... I, I learned that that phrase, culture trumps strategy, from a board member. I was doing an executive search for a, a hospice, and this woman had been the, the person that uh, was to bring together all the Catholic healthcare hospitals into one Catholic system across the country. And she said, culture trumps strategy every time because each of those hospitals had their very own culture and trying to blend the cultures even though they were doing the same business, the same work she said it was the most difficult job she had ever had in her 40-year career and she also said that mergers and acquisitions put the hell back in healthcare. So I don't know if any of you have um, experienced a merger or you've brought another organization into yours or you've, you've um, expanded and you understand that culture can really make, um, make or break an organization. So I, I um, do organizational assessments in my consulting work and I had been working with a new CEO who, who had invited me to come and work with her. And she said, you know, I've, I'm now the third CEO in the last four years, and I really need to figure out what's happening at um, the bedside and what this organizational culture is like, because I can't seem to get my hand around it. So she hired me to do an organizational review. So one of the first things I always do is, you know, walking down the halls, I'm observant. I'm Looking to see, do people look you in the eye? Um, are they saying hello? Are, uh, and in this particular situation, people would walk by us, they would look down. No one would say hello. It was almost like um, a flinching when, when uh, the CEO and I would walk by. Went into the break room and all of the conversation stopped. Nobody wanted to hear, you know, you can't talk in front of the CEO. Um, and then Looking around the break room, what did I see? But dirty dishes piled in the sink. And, and you know, all it took was one look at the microwave and you knew that the sign, your mama doesn't work here, uh, was not heated because nobody paid attention. Their lean cuisines had blown up in the microwave and nobody seemed to care. It was, uh, it was really very kind of depressing. Then as I walked around in the staff room, the, the cubicles had the signs of, um, you know, is it Friday yet posted on, the, on, their, on their walls uh, or that the old image of the cat holding on to the, the link of rope that said, hang in there, it's almost Friday. Or don't ask me, I just work here. Paint was peeling on the walls and there were papers stacked around everywhere and it was, um, it wasn't a very inviting place to work. Then, then I walked down the administration hall. All of the doors were closed. The, and some of the doors had windows on them, but of course all of those windows had, been, had pieces of paper taped over the windows. And then signs like, enter at your own risk, um, or a meeting, don't bother me now. These all, were very loud, loud signs of that organization's culture. I didn't have to ask one question. I could feel what their culture was. And it felt like a half house for prisoners. I did ride-alongs with the nurses and I said, so, you know, what's going on here? You've had this now, the, the third CEO in four years. And she said, yeah, you know, they come and go. We're not going to even listen to what she has to say because she'll be gone in a couple of years too. They, they're not going to stick around. So it was the culture was created by the staff. Leadership had lost control of the culture and had made it a place where it was not, not thriving. And the 
civilization was declining. And, and of course, um, the person who had been there, the original CEO had been there for like 25 years. And, and the board said, oh, you know what, we've, and that person had been in hospice for a long time, obviously, 25 years. And the board had said, you know, we need somebody who is business minded. And, and so they hired one of the board members who had um, worked and on Wall Street and thought he could turn things around until about six months later when someone knocked at the door that said, do not enter and found him sleeping on, uh, with his head on his desk and in the drawer a bottle of whiskey. So therefore that person left and now the person who had hired me was finally there. And I'm happy to say that she's still there and they're, they're thriving. But culture trumps strategy every single time. It's, culture is such an important thing to me that I have a book out called Creating a Culture of Care. And there are essays about what I believe is important about how you create a culture of care, what it takes, and, and who are the people that make up organizations. Because we're in hospice, and, and we're selling widgets. What we're selling are our people, are the people who do this care. And so we have to make sure that um, we have the right people, the right spots, and we have teams that are powerful. Because in a, a study by Harvard of 200 companies, their research, research showed that the companies with the strongest and most compelling teams and most compelling cultures had net income increases of 750% income increase over 11 years. It's proven teams with the most powerful cultures, organizations with the most powerful cultures are the ones that are successful. And the, the most powerful cultures and teams and organizations you think are, you think of places, I think of places like, um, like Disney World and uh, Google and Pixar and Apple, their cultures are intentional. Their cultures are not by accident. In fact, Disney World, which is in Florida, and, and um, I have an annual pack too, they have the Disney Institute where they teach businesses, organizations, leaders, how to create these cultures by intention, not by default. And so, in fact, I'm having my first live event in uh, Disney World in the fall, and we're going to do a back behind the scenes tour of Disney on how they actually create their, their um, culture and, the, and, it, and it, we're going to see it in action. So, like I said, creating cultures started with my love of microbiology back in, in, um, in the early I won't even say what year, but many years ago when I was starting in my nursing school. And I created something called an assessment that I use when I go into organizations. I created the culture inventory. So I want you to take your notes and I want you to think about um, these three questions and grade yourselves in your organization on a scale of one to 10. 10 being we are the best in ever there we have no place to go because we're terrific we're perfect and one being holy Toledo have we got a lot of work to do so I have a, a list of seven issues and I'll I um, I can get you this culture inventory if you'd like I'll show you my email at the end but I'm going to ask three of these seven questions the first is values and I want you to rate yourselves on one to ten the staff personal values are compatible with our organizational values and the staff regularly exhibit behaviors that demonstrate those values. Decisions are made and daily actions are taken by consistently focusing on shared values. Value-laden words are frequently used by all staff at all levels and in all settings. One to ten are you in terms of your organizational presence of values? The second is 
mission. The mission statement is, our mission statement is broad and inspiring and staff those they serve can easily define our mission. The mission statement is prominently and respectfully displayed in all offices and examples of the mission in action are discussed in our staff meetings, our board meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings, and in the community. There is clarity by all staff and volunteers about our mission. Of one to ten, where do you fit? And then the issue of trust in your culture. Staff and leadership bring positive energy and real genuineness into all professional relationships. Authenticity is celebrated, accountability is valued by everyone, truth telling is commonplace, empathy is genuine, and all teams function in unison like schools of fish, all together focused on the same goals and working together, knowing each teammate has each other's back. One to 10. I hope that you're at least a seven or higher on those. And if you're a seven, what can you do to make it up to eight? Perhaps after some of this, um, our webinar today, you will find some tools that will help you re increase those numbers. So when you think about, um, that was the culture inventory. When you think about what it takes to have a great team or a great culture, um, as I travel around the country, different size programs and you know from smaller programs with maybe 100 patients a day to programs with 2500 patients a day it i marvel at the success of the teams that people put together i was fascinated by some research that was done by a man named peter skillman who would who worked with um companies all around the world and starting with Stanford University and the University of California in LA and the University of Tokyo. He, he did his research in these three areas and they put together groups of um, people that he had a, uh, an example of a test that would tell how well teams together. So these three universities work together on this research project. So he put together groups and he challenged them to build the tallest possible structure using only these items. 20 pieces of uncooked spaghetti, one yard of transparent tape, one yard of string, and one standard size marshmallow. The only rule was that the marshmallow had to end up on top of whatever structure that they built. And the object was to build the highest and most sturdy that they could build. Then he observed how these teams went about putting these structures together. They consisted of business school students, of engineers, of lawyers, of CEOs, designers, and kindergartners. So can you guess who was the most successful? The business students began talking and thinking strategically and tossing ideas back and forth and, and questions. And they generated several options about how they should proceed. And then they averaged 10 inches in their tower. And this was consistent over several groups of business students. Then the engineers got together and they built towers that were 21 inches tall. That was pretty good. That was twice as tall as the business students. Then the CEOs got together and they built consistently across these uh, various places, towers that were 22 inches tall. And then the kindergartners. What do you guess the kindergartners did? <laughs> the kindergartners built towers that were consistently 
26 inches tall. The kindergartners beat all these wise professionals who were smart, who had smart IQs, but he noticed something significantly different about the kindergartners that none of the other groups did. You know, the business school students, and I think this can apply to our groups in hospice as well, they, the business students wanted to figure out where they fit into the larger picture. Who was in charge? They wanted to figure out, okay, who has to be in charge? And is it okay to criticize somebody else's opinions or ideas? And what are the rules? We have to establish the rules here. And they, because of their hesitation, they were not able to finish the, the task at very tall in the time frames. The kindergartners, they functioned like that school of fish. They were not competing for status. They stood shoulder to shoulder and they worked energetically together. They experimented and they took risks and they succeeded not because they were smarter, but they worked together in a smarter way. So like I said, team culture is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. And it's something that hospice is built on. Our, inter, inter, our interdisciplinary team is the most powerful thing we have in hospice. And sometimes we take it for granted that the, the different disciplines, the diversity of our team might slow us down when sometimes it's the doctor or only the nurse who speaks. It's our diversity. It's standing shoulder to shoulder where no one is in charge at any given time because sometimes it's the aide that's the most important person in that team. Sometimes it's the volunteer that's the most important person in that team. Teams are the most powerful forces on the planet. And this has been proven by um, a great book called The Culture Code, The Secrets of Highly Successful Groups by Daniel Boyle. He wrote the book Hardball, Hardball, and there was a movie with Brad Pitt, and that's how I remembered it, about using data. But he, he looked at the eight of the world's most successful organizations and teams, and they included SEAL Team 6, the one who took out Osama bin Laden, Disney, like I mentioned before, Google, who, who doesn't go and ask Mr. Google something every single day, multiple times during the day. He looked at successful inner city schools, Pixar, and a pro basketball team. So he really sliced across our whole culture and really, the things that he came up with were the four key issues. And I created them to something that I call the culture shield. So the culture shield is the thing that you can hold up that will protect your organization against any superpower that might come in. It has, if you have these four things, there is nothing that your organization cannot withstand, nothing. And it seems so simple, it seems so basic. It's like, you know, what, what does safety and belonging and shared vulnerability and shared purpose, people take those things for granted. But these are the things that were also present in SEAL Team 6, in Disney, in Pixar, in, in uh, the winningest pro basketball team. These are the things that make a difference. When you have these ingredients, you, your teams and your organization are invincible. And so let's start first with safety. Safety is really the foundation on every strong culture and in fact, Safety is the number one thing on Disney's list of ingredients of why their culture is so strong. Safety. It, it, in, in Coyle's book, he asked what people had in common to describe the relationships that they had with one another, these fabulous, powerful teams. And the word that they used most often was, we feel like family. 
Now, it doesn't mean that you have to, um, you know, in families, we can love each other, we can hate each other, but at the, at the basic, the base of it all is we do love each other and we've got each other's back because blood is thicker than water. So highly successful groups see their relationships as dependent on one another and, and as family. So we have to ask the question, uh, people ask the question, are we safe here? Am I safe here? Is my job safe here? Is our future here safe? And where are these dangers lurking? People won't believe you um, until you prove that you have a safe environment where they can come to work. And I know all of you, you know, in hospice, we have to provide on-call services, weekend services. You have to provide care in sometimes very um, questionable neighborhoods. What kind of safety do you provide for your staff? What kind of insurance do you give them that they're not alone? Can they go with another person to some of those risky neighborhoods? Do they have a, um, can they call the law enforcement if they need to? What kind of support does someone have as a new employee? How safe does someone feel? And how connected do, do someone feel? Group performance de depends on behavior that communicates this one overarching idea. Are we safe and are we connected? So I want you to think about what are some of the ways you provide safety in your organization. I want you to write down two or three things right now or talk to the people if you're in another, if you're in a group setting. Um, what are the ways that you provide safety for your staff? Ensuring that they're gonna get paid every two weeks, that the, there are rules in place so that they can count on their paycheck, their time off, their sick leave, whatever, whatever you have in place, those are, are, are gifts of safety. And those are the things that really matter the most to people. Should I take this job? Should I leave the job at the hospital to come and work at this hospice when I'm not sure if you're really going to be around for the next 10 years or not? Safety is key. So then you look at if you can provide safety, then the next most important issue is this sense of belonging. And so what does that mean? What are the issues around belonging that make people feel like they're part of this whole um, organization? How, how close are you to each other? You know, I've worked in organizations where they, the clinical staff, there's one long um, counter, and if you happen to come in, drop off your paperwork or, or pick up a, um, something, uh, a new computer or whatever it is, you might stay there for 30 minutes and then come into your team meeting for a couple hours twice a week, twice, once every two weeks. What kind of connection does that give people? You have to make sure that you have, you're having these things in, in the sense of belonging. Have you ever heard of or experienced um, something called the imposter syndrome? Where you believe that maybe you're a complete fraud and if somebody ever catches on, you're gonna be uh, kicked to the curb. Certainly, I think everybody has had that imposter syndrome one time or another in their life. I certainly have. This, this lack of confidence, I don't belong here. What am I doing here? And I'll give you an example. A um, number of years ago, when I was the executive director at, at uh, what's now Haven Hospice, I was invited to be on the curriculum committee for the College of Medicine at the University of Florida because our hospice was in Gainesville, Florida. And I thought, wow, 
well, that's pretty great. I'm a nurse. I'm a nurse practitioner. I have masters in my nurse in nursing, but I'm now going to be sitting at a table with a bunch of doctors, not only doctors, but professors of medicine. So I, of course, had a complete imposter syndrome. And I, when I got there, I thought, and no one was giving me much eye contact um, or attention. They just said, uh, you know, here's Patty Moore. She's that hospice lady. And I sat down and was never more uncomfortable. And again, part of it was me, but there wasn't this sense of engagement or belonging. And, and I always felt like I was um, kind of out of the loop. So I sat at the table where I later realized uh, at the next meeting I attended, it was where one of the professors usually sat. So no one had told me that, but I thought, you know, by then I was thinking, I'm going to sit at this table anyway. They've invited me. I'm going to, I'm going to speak. But they didn't give me a chance to, uh, it was all about their agenda. And, and I feel like I was really worthy of being there or even making any difference while I was there. So think about your teams. Think about your interdisciplinary team. I've also been to hospices where the uh, nursing assistants aren't invited teams because they're too busy. Um, and when they are invited, they sit at the edge of the room. They don't get to sit at the table because, oh, we don't have room for them. Or the, um, the only people that speak are the nurse and then the doctor. And the social worker is, you know, if they have anything to say, um, don't often get a chance. The teams that I see that are really vibrant and organizations that are really doing fabulous are the ones where all of those people contribute and everybody has a say because we're looking at this person from all these different angles and every person, every discipline has a point of view to give the best care that we can to these patients that we're responsible for caring for. So think about who sits at your interdisciplinary team. And then how do you integrate a new employee? That's a real pet peeve of mine. You know, new people who come in, they need to have eye contact. They need to have a buddy. They need to have someone say when you walk into the break room, hi, who are you? Haven't seen you before. Come on in. And become engaged in the team rather than just, you know, I wonder who that is. You have a response of creating the culture in your organization. It doesn't land on just the shoulders of the CEOs or the, the executives. Every single person has a responsibility in creating the culture in your organization. And, and if you don't, then you can't complain. So when you think about um, those cues of belonging, then these are some of the things that, again, the research has showed your body language. How do you, uh, how, you know, the ex example I used of people walking down the hall and not looking in your eye. Um, how often are people smiling? How often are people laughing? How much um, do people feel like they're a part of the whole? It's very important in being curious about other people and even something like vocal. You know, I have, a, I have a, um, a voice coach that I use because I do public speaking. And, and so it's very important in how we talk. If you, you end your sentences on an up note and everything you, you talk about is really pretty um, upbeat, people feel happy. But if you say, yeah, today is Tuesday. Yeah, I've got to go do that webinar. Yeah, it's going to be um, on culture of care. That's, that's kind of down. So <laughs> how you use your, your voice is also very important. And it's those little things that make a difference. You might even not recognize them or verbalize them out loud. But the one thing that you can do is put on a smile, particularly for those new employees. And sense of belonging is so important. How many times have you ever been, at, as a kid, 
on the in the recess and people are picking up teams and you're the last one to be selected that feels pretty rotten so imagine how that feels in an organization when you don't feel like your sense of belonging that's key to creating a great environment a great culture of care share a meal bring people in have a breakfast have, um, you know, create ways that people can engage with one another because we're human beings taking care of human beings. Hospice, I've always said, and I still believe this, is not just about health care. It's about human care. It's about human beings caring for human beings at the most difficult time in someone's life as they're dying. So we have to make sure we're taking care of each other as well. So, this is an example of something I call the culture toxin loop. These are negative influences on an ideal culture. And I want you to think about if you have any of these in your organization and if you tolerate them. Because when you tolerate these things, you're only as good as your weakest employee. So if you have the jerk who comes in and acts like a jerk and gets away with acting like a jerk and nobody calls him or her on it and they continue to be a jerk, then the whole organization is brought down because of that. Or the slacker who says, yeah, you know, I'm going to get my notes done. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm always 20 minutes late, but I'm, I'm doing such important stuff. And, um, yeah, I, you know, I don't really need to, to be there at that meeting because it doesn't have anything to do with me. It does. And the slacker is just as, as much a, a problem in an organization as the jerk or the downer. And, you know, I talked about how your voice goes. And if you have somebody, yeah, it's always down. Yeah, um, I, I can't believe this new rules come out. Yeah, they want us to go do this new um, policy. Yeah, it's if the person who's always complaining brings everybody down. And so if you can't hold that person accountable to making, what is it you love about this work? What is it that brings your heart full? Then maybe this isn't the right sp spot for you. Or the person who's afraid and, and doesn't have enough confidence or the person who has the biggest ego and it's always about them. And the person that I think that's the worst, that's the bully, who pushes people around, gets away with it, makes fun of other people, and does it behind, behind the back, and then doesn't take credit um, when someone calls them on the carpet. Or, or the worst I think we see is gossiping. The gossiper who, oh, did you hear Mary just had a, a bad review by her boss? I saw her walking out of the office crying. That's none of your business. We have to hold each other accountable, accountable. And if you don't, you're part of the problem. So I'm, I'm asking you to step up, be the person that you know of high value. These are also um, the team patterns of interaction. These are some of the things I mentioned earlier about these are the things that successful organizations do. They, they, they are in close proximity. And if you have distant offices, how do you connect with one another? I mean, we're doing a Zoom call right now. If you haven't used Zoom, or some kind of technology, to be able to see people's faces, you are missing out. If you're only doing uh, conference calls or sending out email, oh, and don't get me started on the email. Um, if you send three, more than three emails about any topic and it's going back beyond three, you have got to pick up the phone or walk to that person's office and get it settled because emails are be the death of us. Um, lots of pats on the back, lots of hugs. These are the successful team patterns. Um, how much humor and laughter is there? Is there someone that can also really listen when you have a problem or when you're having an issue? Have the kind of eye contact that it takes to have someone feel like you're listening to them 
or are you on your phone and you know, looking at all the things that you think you have to do and not really present with that person? And then it seems kind of silly to even have to say this, but how consistent is your kindness and your courtesy to one another, to yourself? I was just on a coaching call with a group of physicians who said that one of the hardest things that they have to do is remember to be kind to themselves and remember to be compassionate to themselves. So how, how kind and courteous are you to yourself and to, to your teammates? These seem like simple things. These are powerful. And if you can incorporate them into your culture, you're going to have a, a great, great culture of, of care. So the next issue, the next um, superpower protection is something that we call shared vulnerability. And this could be the most powerful of all of them. Shared vul vulnerability comes before we trust each other. And leaders must be vulnerable and often because it's the leadership that sets the tone of whether or not trust is going to be part of the organization. So just imagine um, if a new employee comes back to the or comes back to the office and says, um, you know, uh, to their colleague, wow, I was just at a situation where I wasn't sure what to do. And I was, I'm not even sure if I did the right thing. And um, I, gosh, I'm, I'm really nervous about that. I don't want to tell my boss. And, and so they have then opened themselves up to being vulnerable. So what's the most important piece of that vulnerability connection? It is a two-way street. Is it the person who shares their vulnerability that takes the biggest risk? Perhaps it feels that way. But the person that established trust is the person that receives that vulnerability and how they deal with it. So here's the scenario. The new employees come back with their story. They've told it to their colleague and the colleague does one of two things. They say, you know, you should have known it. It was in the orientation manual. I, I don't have time. Maybe you ought to check with your boss and then walks away thinking, huh, she's going to be in. What do you think that new employee is going to do with that colleague? They're never going to trust that person again. Or what's the flip side of that? The second person is the most important in this two-way street of vulnerability. If they say, oh man, yeah, you know what? I was there too first started. It is really hard and we're going to make mistakes. It's okay. Go in to talk to your boss and tell them, tell him or her um, what you did. And, and you know what? I'm here for you. you. Need it. So how is that trust going to be established after um, they share that vulnerability? Vulnerability is a two-way street and it's something that I don't think we use often enough. And it's something that has to start at the top when the boss can say, you know what, gang, um, we're going to try this new staffing model. I'm, we've done some research. We've at, talked to lots of different places. We're going to give it a try. But if it doesn't work, we're going to try something different. I'm open to, we can all do our best and nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. We're all going to make mistakes and it's okay as long as we keep moving forward. This is, these are the three questions that the Google, um, the senior vice president of HR of Google asks every one of his employees each year. What's the one thing that I currently do that you would like me to continue to do? What's the one thing that I don't currently do frequently enough that you think I should do more often? And what can I do to make you more effective? Those are powerful questions and ones that 
will allow you as a, a supervisor, a director, an executive to connect with your staff in a way that will make them feel like they are valued and that you're learning from them, that you want to learn from them. So this is the powerful culture shield. It's something that every organization should have. And the stronger you have these four simple issues, the more productive your teams can be, the more powerful your organizations can be, and the more successful your hospice, the work that you do can be. And then finally, we come to the shared purpose. Is your mission and purpose clear and embraced by everyone in the organization? And do you connect with those who are also living out the mission of your organization? You know, is everybody accountable to that mission and purpose? And how much do you care and how much do you show that you care? You know, the saying of um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That is absolutely true. And you have to show it in order for people to, to believe it. And I, I believe in starting every meeting, no matter what kind of meeting, if it's a one-on-one -on -one meeting, if it's a board meeting, if it's an IDT, a staff meeting, starting with a story of purpose, of mission. Let's talk about what happened yesterday or today that was really great. Let's talk about this situation that was so difficult that our team really excelled at. I'm really proud of you. If you can begin there and, and set that tone, then your culture of caring will take off. Greatness starts there. And if you have a culture that provides the environment and the safe place to thrive, and that the staff feel like they're enveloped in a sense of belonging, and the leaders are humble enough to show their vulnerabilities, and they show they care and you show you care, then that's where the organizations are going to thrive. That's where cultures thrive. And it takes courage and it takes strength and it takes confidence. And even, yes, that four letter word, love, in the broadest sense of that powerful word, that's what makes a culture of care. That's what makes an organization go from good to great. So I'm going to stop there and I want to um, share that if you would like a free copy of my ebook, a digital copy, copy of my book, Creating a Culture of Care, all you have to do is go to www.creatingaculturofcare.com and sign in and you can have a, um, a free digital copy of my book. So I'm going to stop there and let Morgan see if there are any questions or uh, anything that anybody has that they'd like to talk about.